Good morning, everyone. Today, I'm going to discuss the various aspects of China's growing presence in Latin America. And uh, this is the outline of the lecture. At first, I wanted to give a single lecture, but as it turned out, it was uh, way too long, and I decided to divide the lecture into two parts. In this part, I will cover up to the interest that is the red colored parts in this outline. I will discuss the remaining part, that is China's impacts on Latin America uh, in the next lecture. Relations between the People's Republic of China and Latin America and the Caribbean are a relatively uh, recent uh, development. Until the 1970s, all countries in the region, apart from Cuba, continued to maintain diplomatic relations with Taiwan. In 1971, Chile, under the socialist popular unity government, recognized the PRC, but many Latin American countries did not do so until after 1979, when the United States and the People's Republic of China established diplomatic relations when China began its economic reforms. Nine countries in the region continued to recognize Taiwan and do not have diplomatic relations with the PRC, making the region the most significant concentration of countries that maintain relations with Taiwan. It was during the 1990s that China began to increase its political engagement with uh, Latin America. It first established a strategic partnership with Brazil in 1993. Relations with uh, reason took off at the turn of the century. Further strategic partnerships were signed with uh, Venezuela in uh, 2001, Mexico in 2003, Argentina 2004, Peru in 2008, and Chile in 2012. Chinese presidents Hu Jintao and Xi Jinping have visited Latin America on a number of occasions, while most Latin American leaders have undertaken state visits to China. Although relations with the region remain mainly at the bilateral level, China has engaged in a number of regional initiatives. It was eventually allowed to join the Inter-American Development Bank, IADB, in 2008 after its application was initially blocked by the United States. It has had observer status at the Organization of American States since 2004 and has established dialogues with the regional organizations such as Mercosur and the Andean community. However, the first regional summit between China and the countries of the region, the China CELA, Community of Latin American and the Caribbean States Forum, was not held until 2015. Economic relations between China and uh, Latin America and Caribbean uh, countries remained extremely limited throughout the 1990s, but uh, there has been a dramatic growth since um, the start of the 21st century. Initially, this focused on trade, but since the late 2000s, there has been an increased presence of Chinese companies through foreign direct investment, construction, and 
engineering projects and lending by Chinese banks. Acquiring raw material has been a key part of China's involvement in Latin America, but it is by no means the only aspect. The need to find new markets for Chinese goods has also been a factor in the growth of China's exports to the region and of some FDI and uh, loans. In this lecture, I will sketch the main characteristics of Sino-Latin American relations, the main actors involved, and uh, drivers that have led to close economic uh, links. China's economic relations with uh, Latin America and the Caribbean have taken a number of forms, all of which have increased considerably since the start of the new millennium. Uh, this section documents the growth of bilateral trade, foreign investment, and uh, projects undertaken by Chinese firms in the region and loans and aid provided by China uh, to Latin America and the Caribbean. The significance of China for Latin America and the Caribbean varies considerably between the different kinds of relationships. Trade is central to Latin America's economic relations with China. In the late 1990s, total trade between China and Latin America remained negligible, only around 5 to 8 billion US dollars a year. Bilateral trade grew dramatically from the turn of the century to reach more than 255 billion. US dollars in 2014. Between 2000 and uh, 2015, China's imports from Latin America increased fivefold and the exports to the region eightfold. If you compare 1999 with 2014, which was uh, the peak year, uh, the growth looks um, even more dramatic. Bilateral trade volume fell in 2015 as both the Chinese and Latin American economies uh, slowed down and the global commodity prices fell sharply. Trade between China and Latin America has uh, been relatively balanced overall, in contrast with China's deficit in trade with the Sub-Saharan Africa, which we are going to see next week. And since 2012, China has enjoyed a trade surplus with the region. Of course, this overall picture hides a substantial variation between countries, with China running trade deficit with Brazil, Chile, Venezuela, and Peru, while it has surpluses in trade with other Latin American countries, particularly uh, Mexico. China's import from the region are dominated by primary products and resource-based manufacturers, uh, while exports are almost entirely of non-resource-based manufacturers. China's imports from Latin America and the Caribbean are more heavily concentrated in primary products than those of the United States the EU and Japan. Agricultural products, fuels, and minerals account for about 85% of China's imports from the region. 
the top products that China imported from Latin America in 2013 to uh, 2015 were oilseeds, mainly soybeans, iron ore, and uh, concentrates, petroleum, copper ores, and uh, concentrates, and refined copper, making up uh, more than two-thirds of total imports uh, from the region. They are all primary products or resource-based manufacturers with a limited degree of processing, such as refined copper. One significant aspect of Chinese exports to Latin America is the way in which they have diversified from low-tech manufacturers to products that are more sophisticated, so that uh, they are now more or less equally divided between low, medium, high technology products. Chinese cars, computers, mobile phones, and machinery are becoming increasingly common in the region. Although Latin America is a relatively small trading partner for China compared with the United States, EU, and China's East Asian uh, neighbors. The region has increased its share of both Chinese imports and exports in recent years. In the late 1990s, Latin America accounted for around 2% of total imports to China, but by 2012, this had increased to almost 7%, although it has fallen again since then. China's dependence on Latin America is particularly significant for certain key commodities. Around a quarter of China's imports of iron ore and more than half of the imports of copper ore come from Latin America. The reason, mainly Brazil and Argentina, also provides more than half of China's imports of soybeans. Prior to China becoming a member of the World Trade Organization, or WTO, Latin America accounted for less than 3% of Chinese exports. Since 2001, the region has increased in significance, and by 2012, it accounted for more than 6% of Chinese exports worldwide. The share of primary products in China's imports from Latin America and the Caribbean and the growing share of the region's exports going to China has led to re-commodification or reprimarization of uh, its uh, export uh, structure. As the result, China became the second largest trade partner after USA of Latin America. China has become the largest trade trade partner for South America since 2013. For Mexico, the Caribbean and Central America, the United States uh, remains uh, the number one uh, trading partner. The largest economies of uh, Latin America, Brazil, Mexico, Argentina, Colombia, Chile, Peru, and Ecuador, which account for 
90% of Latin American GDP, exported close to $90 billion worth of exports to China, and imported almost $160 billion, or 78% or more, in 2015. Brazil is the largest trading partner of China in the region. There's more than $80 billion worth of trade between China and Brazil. In the above, I briefly mentioned re-commodification or reprimorization of Latin American exports. Why is it called re-commodification? There had been a period uh, during which uh, Latin American countries exported commodities in Latin America from 1850 to 1930. When Latin American countries uh, uh, became independent from uh, Portugal and Spain, Taking advantage of the Spanish control uh, loosened due to the Napoleonic uh, War uh, in the European uh, continent. Independence was followed by political and economic uh, chaos for uh, another uh, quarter uh, century, and during which time Latin America was virtually this articulated from uh, the former uh, colonial uh, countries and uh, became isolated. In the second half of the 19th century, Latin American countries were re-articulated uh, into international division of labor in the form of export economy. Latin American uh, uh, countries exported uh, primary goods, that is, agricultural produces and minerals uh, uh, to uh, Europe and the United States, and uh, imported the manufactured goods uh, from the, uh, the from Europe and the United States. This resulted in uh, economic boom uh, for Latin America, but uh, made the Latin American uh, economy uh, vulnerable to outside market uh, fluctuation. Indeed, when the Great uh, Depression uh, uh, started, Latin America's uh, export market uh, virtually uh, collapsed and the Latin American countries uh, came to experience uh, an economic uh, crisis. Many uh, are concerned that the second uh, export economy induced by China's growth may have similar effects. This uh, uh, I will discuss uh, later on. Uh, trade is not the only area uh, in which the bilateral relations uh, are getting closer. China is also uh, making investments uh, in Latin America. Chinese investment in Latin America is a relatively recent phenomenon. Despite the rapid expansion of trade relations, during the first decade of the 21st century, Chinese companies only began to invest in the region uh, on a significant scale towards the end of the decade in the aftermath of the global financial crisis. As I briefly mentioned in my previous lecture, uh, foreign direct investment figures quoted for the region sometimes include investment in the Caribbean uh, tax havens, particularly in the Cayman Islands and the British Virgin Islands, 
which between them account for over 90% of the stock of Chinese FDI in the Latin America and the Caribbean uh, area as a whole. These tax havens are not included uh, in the figures used here. No Latin American country is among China's uh, top 10 investment destinations. Still, the $106 billion that China has already invested in Latin America and the Caribbean is quite significant. The stock is certain to grow substantially in the next few years. By all accounts, we have reasons to believe uh, this is a substantial underestimate of the real level of Chinese FDI in the region. First, estimates of Chinese FDI in the region based on media announcements give much higher figures. ECLA, UN uh, Economic uh, Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, estimates that uh, China invested uh, uh, $7.3 billion in the region between 1990 and uh, the 2009, and uh, further $63.5 billion uh, between 2010 and 2015. Another uh, recent estimate uh, put uh, total Chinese investment in Latin America and the Caribbean between 2001 and 2006 at uh, 114 billion dollars. The American Enterprise Institute and the Heritage uh, Foundation, uh, China Global Investment Tracker database reports over 80 billion US dollars of Chinese investment in the region between 2005 and 2015. Figures based on media reports tend to inflate aggregate FDI because not all announced projects are actually implemented and when they are, they are, they may be scaled back. Nevertheless, these figures do confirm that the official Chinese figures underestimate the true level of Chinese investment in the region. Secondly, a high proportion of Chinese FDI appears to come uh, by way of other countries. For example, in 2010, Sinopec spent uh, 7.1 billion acquiring 40% share of the Spanish firm Repsol's uh, Brazilian operation. This was more than double the total stock of Chinese uh, FDI rep reported uh, by China at that time. Sinopex investment was not included in the official Chinese figures because it was made through a Sinopex subsidiary in Luxembourg rather than by the parent company. According to the China Global Investment Tracker, 11% of cumulative Chinese investment between 2005 and 2016 was in Latin America and the Caribbean. How does the level of Chinese investment in Latin America compare to other sources of investment uh, in the region? Despite the large recent inflows, China's share of total inward investment in Latin America 
remains very low. Recent estimates suggest that based on official figures, China accounts for less than 1% of the stock of FDI in the region. Even taking the higher unofficial estimates of Chinese FDI, the share of China in inward investment in recent years has only been around 5 to 6 percent of the total inflows. This still means that it is a relatively minor player compared to EU and the United States, 40 percent and 25 percent of the total uh, respectively. There are several features of uh, Chinese uh, outward foreign direct in investment in Latin America and the Caribbean. As the table on the right side shows, well, Chinese ODI tends to go toward the larger economies in the region. And uh, it tends to go towards resource-rich countries. And uh, it is indifferent to governance environment. And uh, this is uh, consistent with the Beijing consensus. As we will see, the same pattern is observed in Africa. Chinese construction and the engineering projects in Latin America, which are not regarded as FDI, are much less significant in comparison to sub-Saharan Africa, which we are going to look at next week. The total value of completed contracts in Latin America between 2005 and uh, 2015 came to $81.2 billion, according to the Chinese National Bureau of Statistics. While the um, uh, global investment tracker of American Enterprise Institute and the Heritage uh, Foundation uh, gives a somewhat uh, lower figure of uh, 52.3 billion. Venezuela has been the most significant market for Chinese contractors in the region in recent uh, years, followed by Brazil and Ecuador. According to the China Global Investment Tracker, energy has been the most uh, important sector for contracts in the region, followed by transport. Between them, these account for over 80% of total between 2005 and 2015. Although energy accounts for two-thirds of the value of contracts, the most important subsector is hydropower. Oil and gas together account for 16% of the total. The main sector for transport contracts is uh, railways uh, with large deals in Venezuela and Argentina. China does not publish data on official financial flows on either in a country or a regional basis. Uh, a recently developed database, the Inter American Development Dialogue, China Latin America Finance Database, has put uh, together information on loans provided by the uh, Exim Bank of China, the China Development Bank, and other Chinese state institutions to the region. This estimates uh, that uh, between 2005 and 2015, 
uh, these institutions lent a total of more than $120 billion to Latin America and the Caribbean. As in the case of FDI, the bulk of this lending has occurred relatively recently. Before 2007, Chinese lending to the region was minimal, but since 2009, it has been substantial. Now, China's loans are much larger than the combined loans from two traditional sources, World Bank and uh, Inter-American Development Bank. Loans from uh, China uh, Exim Bank, China Development Bank, and other state uh, institutions go to Latin American governments and um, parastatals. In Latin America, the bulk of ch Chinese loans went to the energy sector. As in uh, Sub-Saharan uh, Africa, most of uh, Chinese loans to Latin America were commodity backed, particularly in Venezuela and Ecuador. Both Venezuela and Ecuador are regarded as uh, high-risk countries, and uh, they have low credit ratings. So uh, ensuing repayment through commodity exports helps to reduce the risk for Chinese lenders. Chinese loans to Latin America were dominated by one country, Venezuela, which received more than half of the total loans identified by Inter-America Dialogue since 2005. And the four countries together, Venezuela, Brazil, Argentina, and Ecuador accounted for 95% of the total. Uh, comparing uh, the figures for Chinese uh, lending with the uh, total official uh, finance for the Latin American countries from other sources uh, shows that uh, China is a major source of uh, funds for two countries, Venezuela and Ecuador. Because many Latin American countries are classified as a middle income, they have not been major recipients of official aid. According to China's State Council, Latin America and the uh, Caribbean accounted for only 12.7% uh, of uh, Chinese aid funds in 2009 and 8.4% uh, in 2010 to 12. Based on the estimates of uh, global uh, Chinese aid, this would only uh, amount to around uh, 430 million in 2008. More recently, it has been calculated that uh, Chinese aid to the region came to $560 million in 2013, representing only about 7% of uh, total aid flows to the region and making China the fifth highest ranked donor. It is clear that only a small portion of Chinese financial flows to the region can be classified as ODA, Official Development Assistance. Although total financial flows from China to Latin America in recent years have been roughly similar to those to Africa, its aid flows to the region are less than a sixth of the level of Chinese aid to Africa. 
Latin America plays a less significant role in China's foreign policy than Africa does. China's Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, uh, issued uh, its first policy paper on Latin America as late as in 2008, uh, two years after producing the equivalent document on the Africa. Much of the paper is concerned with economic relations. A second policy paper published in November 2016 also emphasized economic relations. Although diplomatic relations are formally channeled through MOFA, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, economic relations have largely been driven by way of the policy banks and the major state-owned enterprises. Economic relations between Latin America and China involve a number of different actors. Exports are dominated by a number of large companies, including some Latin American state-owned enterprises, such as Codelco in Chile and Pedevisa in Venezuela, large private Latin American companies, such as Vale in Brazil and the major transnational corporations such as uh, Cargill, BHP, uh, Bilton, and uh, Rio Tinto, as well as uh, Chinese-owned oil and mining companies. These companies are responsible for the Latin American exports of oil, minerals, and soybeans that account for the bulk of all exports to China. The actors involved in importing from China are more diverse. They include major transnational corporations such as LG, Samsung, and Dell, uh, who supply uh, their Latin American subsidiaries uh, from China. They also include major department stores and retail chains in the region that rely on imports of uh, Chinese consumer goods. Chinese companies such as uh, Lenovo and Huawei export to Latin America on a significant scale. Uh, there is also an important informal market for imported consumer goods uh, from China in many Latin American countries, often involving contraband goods. The main Chinese investors in Latin America are uh, state-owned enterprises. One study estimates that 72% of the total amount invested by Chinese firms in the region between 2003 and 2016 came from state-owned enterprises. Although private firms accounted for more than half of all cases, they operate on a much smaller scale than investing SOEs, state-owned enterprises. The companies with the largest investments in the region are uh, Sinopec, uh, Sinochem, and the China National Offshore Oil Corporation, Sinuk. The China National Petroleum Corporation, State Grid, and uh, Chinalco. All these companies are owned by the central government. Subnational SOEs such as uh, Shokang Iron and Steel, controlled by Beijing municipality, and the Tongling uh, non-forest metals owned by Anhui province, 
have also made significant investments in the region. Some private Chinese firms have also invested in Latin America, although on a much smaller scale. A growing number of Latin American firms has invested in China. These include food producers such as the Mexican Bimbo and Gruma groups, and uh, Mar uh, from Brazil, Brazil, and companies such as the Brazilian aircraft uh, manufacturer Embra Air and uh, electrical motor uh, manufacturer Ver and the uh, Argentinian uh, firm Tanaris, uh, which uh, produces uh, steel tubes. Although the amount of uh, investment involved is uh, far smaller than Chinese uh, or outward foreign direct investment in Latin America, it does mean that some firms in the region have a direct interest in relations with China. Like Chinese foreign direct investment in the region, project contracts in Latin America are dominated by central state-owned enterprises such as China Energy Construction, Sinomac, and Sinohydro. There is no significant private sector involvement in this area, as we shall see next time in uh, Sub-Saharan uh, Africa, Exim Bank has been China's main lender. In Latin America, the China Development Bank has led the way. In addition to the two policy banks, the Industrial and Commercial Bank of China has also lent to the region. Unlike the Exim Bank, the CDB does not give aid, and much of its lending has been to Latin American state-owned enterprises such as Petroleos de Venezuela in Venezuela and Petrobras uh, in Brazil. As I already noted, Chinese aid in the narrow sense of the word is very limited in Latin America. So there is little direct involvement by government ministries such as those for health or agriculture in China's relations with the region. As elsewhere, China's economic relations with Latin America can be analyzed in terms of the strategic political and strategic economic interests of the Chinese state and the commercial objectives of Chinese firms. Most analysts of Sino-Latin American relations consider China's interest in the region to be primarily economic and commercial rather than political. However, there are those, particularly in the United States, who see China's growing economic relations with the Latin America as part of a broader geopolitical strategy to challenge uh, U.S. hegemony and bring about uh, a multipolar world. In this view, markets and raw materials are only part of the attraction that Latin America holds for Beijing. The larger and arguably more important motivation of Beijing's strategy is geopolitical, not uh, economic. On their part, Latin American countries also appear to be attracted to China uh, 
for economic interests, although some of them are interested in counterbalancing the U.S. dominance and the kind of economic policies the U.S. dominated international financial institutions impose. Some authors uh, have identified competition with the United States as one of the China's key objectives uh, in expanding its presence in Latin America. Some claim that uh, since uh, 911, the U.S. Uh, has tended to neglect Latin America, which has created a vacuum that uh, China has moved in to fill. It has also been argued that uh, China sees a growing presence in the backyard of the United States as a means of uh, countering the growing U.S. presence in East Asia since uh, Barack Obama administration pivot to Asia. This implies that uh, China will particularly focus its economic engagement on those countries which are most opposed to U.S. Uh, influence in the region, such as Venezuela, Ecuador, and Bolivia. This view is particularly uh, prevalent among uh, neoconservatives who regard China's growing involvement as a strategic threat to U.S. interests in the region. In sharp contrast to this Chinese threat view, most Chinese scholars see China's growing presence in Latin America as driven by strategic economic and commercial concerns and play down the significance of geopolitical considerations. They stress that um, China uh, recognized Latin America as a U.S. sphere of influence and has been very careful to avoid antagonizing the United States by allying itself too closely with the Latin American governments that are hostile uh, towards the United States. This second view corresponds closely to the official line of the Chinese government, which emphasizes China's peaceful rise and a harmonious world. Most non-Chinese commentators share the view that China's increasing economic relations with the Latin America are not primarily uh, politically motivated, and that uh, closer political relations uh, with China are a consequence rather than a cause of uh, China's growing economic involvement in the region. The pattern of Chinese trade and investment in Latin America is also consistent with China's emphasis on national sovereignty and non-interference in the internal affairs of other countries, which is the core element of the so-called Beijing Consensus. Indeed, China is willing to do business with a wider range of different regimes. It has developed strong economic links with uh, countries such as Chile and Peru, which are friendlier towards the United States, as well as with countries that have been critical of U.S. imperialism, such as Venezuela and Ecuador. One area where there is clear evidence that political factors have played a key role in determining economic engagement is in relation to Taiwan. 
countries that recognize Taiwan obtain much less um, OFDI from China and virtually no loan uh, from China. Competition with uh, Taiwan to obtain diplomatic recognition under its One China policy was a consistent feature of Chinese foreign policy up to 2008 and was particularly intense in Central America, uh, which has the largest uh, concentration of countries which still recognize Taiwan. In 2007, Costa Rica broke off relations with the Taiwan and established uh, the diplomatic relations with the uh, People's Republic of China. As a result, China bought um, $300 million of Costa Rican government bonds and provide $20 million in aid for reconstruction after major flood damage occurred. Between 2008 and 2016, when there was an informal truce between Beijing and Taipei, there were no further switches of diplomatic allegiance. With the pro-independence Democratic Progressive Party returning to power in Taiwan in 2016, the PRC renewed its effort to get more countries to switch recognition and uh, Panama broke off relations with uh, Taiwan and recognized Beijing in 2017, followed by Dominican Republic and El Salvador in 2018. With President uh, Chai Ing-wen re-elected early uh, this year, it is likely that the other countries in the region uh, will be pressured to establish relations with the People's Republic of China in the foreseeable future. Most Chinese uh, foreign direct investment is controlled by the Chinese state. Therefore, it is uh, qualitatively different from other foreign direct investment in Latin America. The commercial objectives of Chinese firms are not entirely separate from the strategic economic objectives of the Chinese state. Uh, indeed, government policies are often intended to ensure that uh, commercial interests coincide with the strategic aims of the state. The interests of firms and those of the state uh, often overlap. For example, Oil companies and the government have a common interest in diversifying their source of supply. Despite the fact that the majority of Chinese investment has been made by state-owned enterprises, 
some studies of the particular sectors and firms uh, support the view that uh, while they enjoy government support, uh, they operate uh, with uh, considerable autonomy and their investments reflect uh, their uh, commercial uh, interests. Uh, some studies also highlight the differences uh, between central and provincial uh, state-owned enterprises. The other side of the growing Sino-Latin American economic uh, relations is uh, the Latin American interest in expanding uh, the ties. Although the response to China's re-emergence in Latin America has been largely uh, reactive, it is clear that uh, it has been partly shaped by interests in the region. Again, these interests can be usefully divided into Latin American states' uh, strategic, political, and strategic economic objectives and the commercial motives of uh, uh, private economic uh, actors. Uh, from a uh, geo-strategic point of view, the re-emergence of China has been seen by some as providing an opportunity to counterbalance U.S. influence in the region. The most obvious case where a Latin American government has sought Chinese support to counter the United States politically was in Venezuela under President Chavez. However, China was reluctant to be seen as deliberately challenging the United States in the region. Recently, the Bolivian and Ecuadorian governments have also looked to China as a counterweight to U.S. hegemony. However, most of the governments of the region have not sought to develop their relations with China for geostrategic purposes. Some governments in the region have seen the expanding relations with China as a way of increasing uh, policy space, so to speak. It makes them less vulnerable to the conditionalities uh, of the Washington consensus and gives them a greater uh, scope uh, to pursue alternative economic policies uh, free from external pressures. This is uh, particularly attractive for left-wing governments uh, in the region that uh, reject um, uh, neoliberalism and that are eager to re-establish a significant role uh, for the state uh, in their economies. Despite the political interest of some Latin American states in developing closer economic relations with China, the main strategic objectives of most governments in the region in expanding relations with China are economic. The rapid growth of Chinese economy has made it an attractive market for governments which are keen to increase their exports and find new markets. In some countries such as Chile, where state-owned enterprises contribute significantly to exports, and Argentina, which taxes agricultural exports, governments have also seen their revenues rise as a result of their growing relations with China. Governments in Latin America, as elsewhere around the world, have also been keen to attract Chinese foreign direct investment in order to raise the rate of accumulation. In Chile, Peru, and Costa Rica, the expectation that the agreements would help attract Chinese investment was an important uh, motive for 
negotiating free trade uh, agreements with China. Those countries in the region that have defaulted on debts uh, in the recent past, such as Argentina, Ecuador, and Venezuela, and therefore uh, find it difficult to access international capital markets or can only do so at a very high interest rates, have a particular interest in obtaining loans from China. Although the strategic economic interests of governments have played some role in the region's relations with China, on the Latin American side, they have been largely driven by commercial interests. Exports have boomed as a result of Latin American firms and transnational corporations taking advantage of high commodity prices. The growth of imports from China has also been driven by Latin American retailers' interest in obtaining cheap consumer goods and by many transnational corporations with operations in Latin America optimizing their global supply chain strategies to import parts and components or finished products from affiliates or contract manufacturers in China. Some Latin American companies have also invested in China as part of their global expansion, taking advantage of the rapidly growing Chinese market. Okay, that's uh, for the day. And um, in my next lecture, I will discuss the impacts of uh, China on the Latin American economy, society, politics, and the environment. See you next time. Bye-bye.